Uh, let me just give you a brief, very brief, because I want to sort of get to the business at hand. It's amazing how the Torah Pasha goes hand in hand with what we're doing today. Let me tell you a quick little story. Quick. There was a couple who gave birth to a set of beautiful, identical twins. And as the children grew, they seemed to have vast character distinction. One was the quintessential optimist, and the other one was the die-hard pessimist. They got to be about 10 years old, and the parents became incredibly frustrated. So they sought out a child psychologist who specializes with behavior modification. Took their two boys, their twins, to see this psychologist. The psychologist said, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to do a little test, a little test to see what I'm dealing with. So he took the pessimist in a room, and the room was filled with all kinds of magnificent toys and gifts. And as this young man opened up each box, he sighed, and his complaints got stronger and stronger with every one he opened. And the doctor was, wow, this, truly these parents didn't make this up. So he took the optimist in a room, and there was one big gigantic box, huge. He needed a stepladder just to open it up. And the doctor filled the box up with horse manure. And he climbs up, and the kid jumps in, and he's flinging this horse manure everywhere. And he's going, woohoo, yippee, woohoo. And the doctor says, what are you so excited about? And he goes, with all this horse manure, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> the point of the story is children have very different personalities, even when they come from the same biological parents and we'll try to figure it out and it's uh, sometimes it's not figurable and the moral of the story is parenting is not easy so if you're sitting here and you have raised children I'm sure you did it to the best of your ability so my hat's off to you now let's get into the Torah portion a little bit we're in Genesis 32 and you know what's going on here or hopefully you should know what's going on and if you don't I'll help you out that's why I'm here the twins Jacob and Esau are being reunited. Yes? The reuniting of the twins. Now, you have to understand what's going on prior. Up until now, all of the blessings Jacob have, has acquired were the result of deception and cunning on his part. Every blessing that he received was manipulation. This was the way of the flesh. That's what the Bible is trying to describe. Jacob, the name is defined as schemer, trickster, deceiver, and follower of men. I'm going to show you some scriptures that we read. I'm just going to add about one. Genesis 32, 3 through 6. It says, Yaakov, Jacob, sent messages ahead of him to Esau, his brother, toward the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Edom is where? Jordan. Edomites. Modern day Jordan. And Seir is where in Jordan? southern Jordan and so in other words he's been at Laban's house for 20 years Jacob and he's told by the angel of God to go back to Israel what does he have to pass through there's no roundabout way he has to go through Seir and who is he going to run into if he goes through Seir who's the head of Seir Esau his brother and is there any bad blood between him and his brother yeah he stole his birthright totally totally took his birthright from him he took it twice. One time the guy is hunting. Now he's hunting probably for days, and he hasn't eaten in days, and he hasn't slept in days. It's not like what we do today. If they don't hunt and find any food, there's no Kroger or Publix. So he was out there for days. It says, the Bible says, he came home exhausted. He probably couldn't see straight. Have you ever been up for five days? I have. You can't see straight, and you can't think straight. And he comes in, and what is Jacob doing? lounging at the table. No, he's, he's ready to eat it. He's not just making it. He's, and he comes in, and he's like, I'm starving. He goes, you want it? He, I'm telling you, he was a total, total conniver. And then he works with his mother to connive again to put some fake hair on his arm so that his father in his dying day would give him the birthright. So I'm thinking that Esau is pretty, pretty steamed, Okay. And Jacob, the conniver, knows that. So 
Here is what you're saying. He's sending some, he's with his entourage. Who is he with? His two wives. Well, actually, his four wives. Because his two wives had handmaidens that he had to marry. And then he had flocks. And he had the herdsmen who were working the flocks. He had 11 children. His 12th child was born in Israel. And he had a whole entourage from them. So this is what he says. He goes, here is what you are saying to my lord Esau. Okay? Here's what you're to say. It's a preemptive peace offering, if you will. He's not waiting to get into Edom. He's sending his folks ahead of him. And he says, your servant Jacob says, I've been living with Laban and have stayed until now. I have cattle, donkeys, and flocks, male and females. There was no money back then. So what, in modern day, what would he be saying? I got cars. I got homes. I got cash. Whatever he wants. Again, what is he doing here? Again, he's following his own way. Again, he's conniving. Again, he's up to his old tricks. Sometimes nothing changes. I am sending to tell this news to my Lord in order to win your favor. So the messengers go and let Esau know. Listen, your brother's coming, and, and we have all these flocks for you, okay, as a peace offering. He's very sorry. And they come back with this news. Can you imagine how Jacob's sitting on pins and needles, wondering? Listen, we went to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you. Great, with 400 guys. That doesn't sound good, does it? Why is he bringing 400 of his fighting men with him to meet his brother? Not good news. Jacob, though, has a wonderful encounter with the Lord, which I'm a big fan of. I think in order to get deep with the Lord, you've got to have an encounter with him. And I wouldn't live in an encounter that you had in 1976. I would look for one every day. I would look for a divine encounter every day, and I would look to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily. That's just me. Look at Genesis 32, 23, 25. In some of your versions, it's going to be 22, 24. He got up that night, that is Jacob, took his two wives and his two slave girls and his 11 children and crossed the Yabuk, the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and then sent his possessions across and Jacob was left alone. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Then some man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now you have to understand, well I'd like you to understand, or I'd like you to consider for your understanding, that no word in the Bible is used haphazardly. Every single word has a meaning. In fact, in Hebrew reckoning, in Jewish reckoning, every number has a word associated with it. Every word and every letter has a value. It's called gematria. It's very intense, but it, but it all makes sense. Because God is very simple, but he's very complex at the same time. This word, jabuk, says it all for me. Look at this word in the Hebrew. It means emptying or to become empty. So what is the Bible saying here? Jacob is finally coming to a place where he's going to surrender. Remember in Genesis 28, he has that incredible vision of the ladder and the angels are going up and down? That ladder being Yeshua, coming down from heaven, God was saying, hey, you can, you can do all you want, but the way to get to me is not for you to climb the ladder. I'm coming down. It's going to be my grace, my mercy, my work. Even with that encounter, if you remember correctly, in Genesis 28, you know what he says? He says, I'll tell you what, God, if you do this and this and this, then you'll be my God. Right? You check it out. Read Genesis 28. That's backwards. That's not the way it works, man. Not, well, and, and if you don't do it, then you won't be my God. What? You, this. God is God. You're just the man. You're just the servant, right? If he's master, you're servant. It's more like, well, if you do this, this, and this, God says, then I'll be your God. That's the way it works. We got to do the if, and he does the then. So he's going to have an encounter with the Lord, but he's coming to the end of himself, which I'm telling you right now, listen to me, you will never come to the true beginning of God until you come to the end of yourself. You could like God, you could love God, you could sing to God, but you will never, ever be deeply intimate. Never hear the voice of God on a daily basis until you come to the end of yourself. Jacob had it all figured out. You know, I, I don't know if you can relate to this, but I can so relate to it because back before I had my encounter with the Lord, you know, my divine encounter in Israel, I had it all figured out. I had cars and homes and money to burn. 
and I was totally full of myself and totally thought I could make it work. And then in 1989, when the Lord hit me, you know what happened? Lost my job, lost my money, lost my wife, lost my hair. My hair started falling out in 89. <laughs> and I lost my mind. But I truly found the Lord. And from that day on, he's been building me back up better than I would have ever imagined. I'm here to tell you, I think that's a prerequisite. You can live on the periphery. You can, you can know the Lord, kind of. You can call on him when you need him. But I'm just saying you're missing out on something amazing if, if, if you stay in the periphery. Genesis 32, 26, 27. It says, when he saw that he didn't defeat Jacob, first of all, this is not a God. You know, some, some, of the, some, of the, some of the people say it was a dream. You know what? You don't, you don't dislocate your hip in a dream unless you fall out of bed. And they had no mattresses back then. He's laying on the floor. It wasn't a dream. And clearly it wasn't just a guy. Because we see later in the narrative that it was the angel of the Lord. It was a theophany. It was the Lord himself who came down. Now, before we even go on, what kind of God do we serve who's willing to leave his heavenly abode and get down in the dirt and wrestle with you? If you don't fall in love with that God, man, you're going to miss it. He wrestles with him. He strikes Jacob's hip socket. Now, have you ever dislocated your hip? I have dislocated my shoulder two times. I've separated my chromium clavicular joint two times, and I pulled the bicep tendon right out of the shoulder recently. It is painful. It's a ball and socket joint. It, it, it goes right into your hip, and when that thing yanks out, man, you're pulling on all the tendons and all the ligaments, and the pain is like, yow! Dislocates his hip. The man said, let me go, because it's daybreak. They're wrestling all night long. You know what? Sometimes you've got to wrestle with the Lord for a while to get it. Jacob replied, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Something vast is changing. He's not the same Jacob. The same, you know what the Jacob would have, first of all, the Jacob would have gave up. He went to hung on. Secondly, the Jacob I know would have said, hey, obviously you're some powerful angel. Relocate my hip. He doesn't ask for a hip replacement. He asks for a blessing. Now he understands what it is to cling on to God, to let go of his cunning, his manipulation, his ideas, his dreams, his wants, his desires, and he's really going to focus on serving God. Is that just for Jacob? No, baby. That's for all of us. This is not, Jacob is not a special guy. Abraham, Isaac, they're guys like us, human beings. And this is the prerequisite for us to follow God. We got to give up on our own ideas, our own wants, our own desires. Yeshua said it best. You want to follow me? Deny yourself. He said that coming out of the gate. So Jacob's ready. He's ready to hold on to God with all he has. And he doesn't ask to get fixed. He wants a blessing. Father, I want you to provide for me. I want you to be my God. Remember his prayer. He says, oh, the God of my grandfather and the God of my father. You can't pray like that. It's got to be your personal God. God has no grandchildren. He doesn't even know God that well, but now he does. And he's going to hang on with all he has. He's going to be tenacious and grab onto God. And God says, you get it. He's not looking for the immediate need. My advice to you is don't change your limp for a strut. Jacob. Would have walked, there was no orthopedic surgeons, no MRIs, no CT scans, nothing, man. Those ligaments and tendons were never going to heal right. Jacob walked like this all his life, so he wouldn't forget. Keep limping. God wants to be your God, so you got to be needy. you got to be dependent. you got to be broken. Otherwise, baby, it won't work. He's not a 911 God. He doesn't want that relationship. He wants to be your knight in shining armor. Therefore, you have to be the damsel in distress. 
Last but not least, Genesis 32, 28, 29, it says, the man asked, what's your name? If he's the angel, does he know his name? Of course he does. He wants to know if Jacob knows his name. Jacob, who are you? I, 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 I'm a conniver. I'm Jacob. I'm a conniver. I'm a liar. I'm a manipulator. I'm a trickster. I'm a deceiver. Don't you understand? We live in a society today, some of you, all the folks, you, you can't stand it because nobody wants to be responsible. Well, sometimes in the body of believers, we don't want to be responsible. You got to tell the Lord, you're a conniver. You're a player. You're a liar. If you want to be truly delivered, you got to own to disown. God won't take it away from you until you claim that you have it. The man said, you get it. You get it. You're having a heart change. There's repentance going on. You're making teshuva. Hallelujah. From now on, you're not going to be a liar and a cheater and a scoundrel and a conniver and a manipulator. Uh-uh, man. We got a big call for you, buddy. You're going to give birth to the 12 tribes. One of those tribes is going to give birth to the king of all kings. It's a big, fat call. Mm-mm. Now you're going to be called Israel. He goes from Jacob to Israel. He goes from heel holder to God grabber. Israel means God prevails or God strives. My take is God strives as man dies. There is no way around it, guys. There is no way around it. Exodus 19, 3, leading into our dedications. This is when it's in the third month. It's Shavuot or Pentecost as we know it in the Western world. They have been out of Egypt now for three months. And they're ready to go into the promised land. They're in the wilderness, as which we are. We're not home yet. We're not home yet. We're in the wilderness. So Moses, the spokesman for the Lord, goes up to God and he's waiting. And Adonai, the Lord says, come, come. Come here. Here is what you ought to say to the household of Jacob to tell the people of Israel. Not just Jacob's household, but all the people in Israel. Now, if you will pay careful attention, you see, this is what Jacob missed first round in Genesis 28, but he got it in Genesis 32, thank God. Now, if you will pay careful attention to what I say and keep my covenant, this has not changed. I'll show you. Then you will be my own treasure. You know what that means? That's segulot. You know what a segalot is back in the days of the Bible when there were war between warring kingdoms? Whichever king was victorious, they would put out all the booty, all the booty in front of that king from the other kingdom. And he'd walk up and down and survey all the treasure and he would go, that's the one I want. Can you imagine? That was called the segalot. Can you imagine God goes back and forth all over the earth and looks at you and go, you're the one I want. You're the one I want. You're the one I want. Woo! <laughs> You'll be my treasure from among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. I own it all. And you will be a kingdom of priests for me. What is better than what can you accomplish in life? What you want to be a CEO of a company? You want to make money? You want to get a few trophies? Cool. Knock yourself out. But man, I'm satisfied with being God's priest. And I ain't talking about because I'm ordained. And you will be a kingdom of priests. Mamlechet Kohanim. A nation set apart. Goy Kadosh, a holy nation. These are the words you were to speak to the people of Israel. All right, Rabbi, I get it. That's for the people of Israel. Those are for the Jews. This is a new era. Is it really? That's what you think. <laughs> Go to the next. <laughs> First Peter 2.9. You are our chosen people. Who is he speaking to? The king's priests, a holy nation, a people for God to possess. Why? So that you could declare the praises. What, what is, I understand you got to make a living, you got to put food on the table. I get that. That's fine. But that's not who you are. That's what you do. Don't make what you do who you are. You are a priest of a holy nation. You are a Kohen. And you were called out of darkness into God's 
wonderful light. The overall message of this Pasha and the overall message for your children and the overall message for us is you can't live like a prince of God if you're a follower of man. You can't serve two masters. Make this day a day of choice. We're going to dedicate the children. You might wonder why are we dedicating 32? Because we're a cult. No, because... <laughs> no, because it, it worked out that way. We don't, we don't plan. There's no, there's no, if you know me as well as you know me, we don't plan anything. Man's plans, garbage cans. We let the Lord do what the Lord wants to do. Only the Lord could have put this section with the dedication. Only the Lord could have pulled it off. We, we can't do a better work than he. So we just let him do his thing. You might wonder, is this biblical? Is dedicating a child? Yes. We didn't make this up. This isn't some... No, it, look, look in Luke. Well, don't look at that screen because there's no projector. It's in California being fixed. But look at this one. It says, on the eighth day... What is... Jesus doing getting circumcised on the eighth day. He is Jewish. He's not was Jewish. It's not past tense. He didn't convert. He's not a Methodist. He's still a Jew. It says, on the eighth day when it was time for his Brit Milah, time for his circumcision. Don't you understand? This is from the Torah. If he doesn't get circumcised on the eighth day, then he's in violation of the law or a lawbreaker. A lawbreaker equals sinner. You wanted him to obey the law, right? And he wants us to, too. He was given the name Yeshua. The name. You, you get, in Judaism, when I, was, when I was circumcised on the eighth day, I was given, I have a certificate, I was given a name. I was given a Hebrew name. That's what I was given. And he was, too. Which is what the angel had called him before his conception. The angel spoke to his mother and said, this is what I want you to name him. I still believe that there's angels that speak to us that tell us what to name our children, if you're willing to listen. There was in Jerusalem a man named Shimon. This man was a tzaddik. What was a tzaddik? A righteous man. Was he perfect? No, but he was righteous. He was a righteous man. He was devout, and he waited eagerly for God to comfort. That's what Messiah is known in the Jewish world, the comforter of Israel. And the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, was on him. Wait a minute, that didn't come to Pentecost. That's what you think. It's been around for a long time. <laughs> Ever since God's been around, His Holy Spirit's been around. <laughs> and the Ruach HaKodesh was on him, prompted by the Spirit. He went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child to do for him what the Torah required, Shimon took him in his arms and said a bracha, a blessing over that child. So we're not going to try to reinvent the wheel. We're going to do, if it was good enough for Yeshua, by golly. Proverbs 22.1 says, rather than wealth, choose a good name. Esteem a name over silver or gold, meaning it's more precious than even precious metals. you got to understand that a name in Hebrew comes from the word Shem. And Shem translates as reputation, renown, and character. Do we have a slide with Shem? So it's, it's more than just some inherent meaning. It's, it's a reputation. That's why when we call people in Judaism up to the Torah to read the Torah, it's always, Yamod, Getzel Moshe, Ben, Meavelva. Why? Why do we always have to say whose son he is? Because every child either brings honor or dishonor to his parents, depending on how they live their life. Reputation, renown, and character. How, how would your child be remembered? Now, Hebrew names are given to honor the dead. Like my name, I don't know how my mother came up with Gregory because she's a devout Orthodox Jew. And the only Gregories I knew back in history, keep their memory alive. That's what it's all about, keeping their memory alive. So I was named from Gregory Getzel. It doesn't have to translate. A lot of names don't translate. That's not the issue. Getzel is Yiddish, and it means friend of God, okay? And my middle name, Moshe, means drawn, Friend of God who's drawn. That's what my name means, and that's the name I was given on the eighth day. I did not feel the least bit led by the Holy Spirit to declare a Hebrew name over your child. I, I just didn't do that because, first of all, I'd have to find out 
who passed away and what was their name and on and on and on. And not, not, not that it would have been laborious because this was, some of your names are, yeah, they, like they don't exist. And so it was hard to just even find the derivation, the meaning. That's not the way I was led. The way I was led was that the birth names that you guys chose, believe it or not, I feel the Lord helped you choose it. And I didn't want to mess with that, okay? Now, those names, all your names for your boys and your girls, have inherent meaning, which means there's an inseparable element that you chose, okay, or the Holy Spirit chose through you. But the Lord let me to find or try to find the spiritual connotation. And I, I've been working on this for like two weeks, believe it or not, um, just hours and hours in prayer, just trying to seek the Lord for your children. And so when I give you the spiritual connotation for your child, and I give you a scripture that the Lord gave me, you know, nobody's 100%. So if you don't like it, <laughs> you, don't have, you leave it here. Leave it right on the seat. And, but we have these beautiful certificates. these beautiful certificates here and we have your child's name and the parent's name and the date that they were dedicated 17th of Kislev 5773 which on the Gregorian calendar is December 1st 2012 and we put the spiritual connotation of their name as the Lord gave it to me and a little just the not the ver just what where the verse comes from so it's really small so you can put it in a frame and keep it really far from people if you don't want them to see it. And when people come in the house, just, what's that? <laughs> but we, we, we really wanted this to be special. I woke up 3 o'clock. I could not sleep. I was just so excited for you guys, so excited for your families. And I, I just want to be a blessing. Okay, three times in Deuteronomy, which is kind of like a retelling. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. And Moses is speaking on God's behalf, and this is what he says. What great nation is there that has a God so close to them as Adonai, our God, who's there whenever we call upon him? No busy signal, no answer machine, and not even a call waiting. Right through. What great nation is there that has laws and rulings? We think in our flesh laws are bad. No, every nation has laws. You have laws. Some of you make me take off my shoes in your house because you like your rug. I'm okay with it, but it's a law. God's laws aren't bad. His ways are ways of protection. You will never, ever convince me that one of his laws is bad. You will never, ever convince me that if we didn't follow his laws, we wouldn't be better off. Nobody will convince me of that. What great nation is there? It's rhetorical. That has laws and rulings as just as his entire Torah, which I'm setting before you today. Only, you know, you can agree with it, right? Amen. Just like I could say, is exercise important? You go, amen. Is anybody exercising? The amen is insignificant. You don't have to agree. It's irrefutable. Taking care of the poor, the widow, and the orphan. Staying married. Not being a deceiver and being honest. It's all right. So what's wrong with the world. It's the world. It's right. You can't argue it. Just a matter of whether you want to do it or not. That's the issue. Only be careful, parents, and watch yourselves diligently as long as you live so that you won't forget what you've seen with your own eyes, so that these things won't vanish from your hearts. If you don't love the Lord, your kids won't. And if you walk around miserable and down and out and complaining, your kids will too. Rather make them known to your children, grandparents, and your grandchildren. Again, the watchword of Israel, Deuteronomy 6, it's spoken four times by Orthodox Jews. Verses 4 and 7. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear Israel, the Lord our God, He's one. And you are to love the Lord your God with part of your heart, with part of your being, with some of your resources. It's not a suggestion. It shouldn't even be a command. It shouldn't even be a command. It should be a delight. With all your heart, all your being, all your resources, these words which I'm ordering you today, put them on your heart. 
and teach them carefully to your children. You want to talk about them when you sit in your home, when you're traveling. Nobody cares. They don't care what car you drive. They don't care about vacations. They don't care how much money you have in the bank. They could care less. I want to give them everything that we didn't have. What didn't you have? If you're gone before they wake up and you're home after they go to sleep and you're never in the house and you're never walking with them, how are you going to fulfill that? And it's doable. Don't make them memorize a verse. It doesn't mean anything. Why should they memorize something they don't understand? Just the other day, I took Maxi to play paintball with a few of his friends. Two kids. And so they're at this paintball place, and nobody's there. And all of a sudden, two guys come, ex-military. One, a SEAL. And they're going to play against Max and his two friends. Three 10-year-olds. So they're like, Dad, these, these guys are... I said, come here. Come here. I have my Bible with me. I opened up 2 Corinthians. I said, King Asa went against the million Ethiopians. And he said, I have nothing, God, but I have you and my eyes are on you. And they beat them seals. <laughs> talk about them. Talk, don't make a mem me Talk about them like you know the Lord. Like it's important. Like you love the Lord. And last but not least, again in Deuteronomy, he says the third time, teach them carefully to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house. Don't sit behind a computer for three hours. Every time, every place, every activity, parents, be conscious to walk the word. Don't talk the word. You're going to exasperate them with too much mouth. Walk it. They want to see it and be real. Don't make like you're holy in the now. Be real. They need to see reality. This is my personal prayer for your children. It was on New Testament reading. Revelation 7, 11, 12. This is really my prayer. When I thought, what would I pray over your kids? This is my prayer. My prayer for your children, our children, as I like to think of them. I hope you don't mind. I would like them to join in with the angelic host and with the 24 elders and the four living beings who are right now, right now as we speak, they're doing this. I would like them to fall face down before the throne and worship God. I would like them to fall face down. Not goofy stuff, not goofy little stories but fall face down and worship God. And I'd like them to say along with the angelic host, Amen! Amen! The truth has become true. Not yes. Amen! The truth. This truth of the greatness of God has become true to me. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. And I hope they say belong to my God forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. You're dancing. You take my sadness and turn it into joy. Amen. Amen. If I can get you to rise one more time and maybe come close to each other, grab a hand of somebody that's close to you. I'd love to speak a blessing over you as you depart. Have a great day today with your family. Enjoy. Love each other hard. And uh, don't, don't major on the minors. You'll miss it. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Shalom. I love you. Shabbat shalom.